I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Before purple aliens snapped half our world into ash, before the adorable dancing tree people, and even before we witnessed Robert Downey Jr. take his first flight as Iron Man, setting up a world that would eventually become the biggest ongoing movie franchise of all time, we had a serious vampire problem. Vampires, they're everywhere. With confirmation of beloved Hollywood actor Mahershala Ali taking on the role as Blade and making his way into the MCU, what better time is there to revisit Marvel's first big screen outing since... Around this time, comic book films had been going through a complete overhaul in Hollywood as movies like Tim Burton's Batman and Wes Craven's Swamp Thing were being traded for more lucrative toy opportunities like Joel Schumacher's Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. And while all of these films have their place in the hearts of comic book movie fans, the late 90s were no place for bat credit cards and villainous ice puns. At least not for the folks at New Line Cinema. The year is 1998, and times for cape and tight superhero movies were different. Until we got this. He makes the weapons. I use them. This open season on all suckers. Blade. This trailer blew minds through the screens of many households and it got people talking. The trailer featured a much darker take on the comic book movies that we were used to seeing. The colors were high in contrast and dark, the visuals were edgy and certainly scary in the way that they portrayed vampires and even featured a song that would go on to grace the households of many teenagers in 1998, Confusion by New Order. This preview captured the attention of comic book and horror fans and aroused an interest in moviegoers across the globe. Was this a horror film? Was this a superhero film? A vampire action thriller? Well, yes, yes, and oh yeah. You're one of them, aren't you? No, I'm something else. Now at this time, comic book movies weren't exactly the big box office draw that they are today. But that didn't matter to Stephen Norrington and David S. Goyer as the duo were hard at work in bringing to life the gothic and nocturnal world of Blade. Before becoming the money-making juggernaut, uh, no pun intended. Actually, pun very intended. Marvel actually had some frequent financial struggles and had to resort to selling off its IP to various studios in Hollywood. Among this lineup was Blade, a half-human, half-vampire whose motivation stems from a vampire attack on his mother during her pregnancy with him. Can't wait to meet up with daddy again. While the movie certainly takes its share of liberties in changing some of Blade's origin, there are some similarities that are transferred directly from the page to the screen. Today, we're going to revisit the 1998 hit that opened the doors for the MCU to exist today. But where did it all start? Find out in today's episode of our brand new series, Marvel Revisited. Thank you for visiting Joe Blow. If you like the show, please make sure you like and subscribe and make sure you hit notifications so you don't miss anything. Let's get back to the show. Blade's comic book origins began with Marv Wolfman and Gene Colan in 1973 as Blade made his first appearance in the Tomb of Dracula. While Blade originally didn't have the exact same power set as his movie counterpart, the Blade that most of us have come to love and expect is more closely related to the dark and stoic version that we get in the film. When the idea of a live-action Blade movie first came out, it was originally pictured as a western film set in Mexico and was supposed to star Richard Roundtree as the titular Daywalker. Are you out of your damn mind? Later, rumors that rapper LL Cool J taking on the role began circulating and even yielded some interest from the artist. Eventually, the rights ended up in the hands of New Line Cinema, who commissioned a script from David S. Goyer, who had just come off of writing Dark City and the previously released TV movie Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Goyer delivered a pitch that was not what the studio had in mind. David Goyer was able to convince the studio to go from developing Blade as a satirical parody on vampire films to giving it the dark and postmodern vampire story that unfolds in the theatrical cut of the film. After failing to get a Black Panther project off the ground, Wesley Snipes was offered to star as Blade and who could have predicted the massive success he was going to find with this character? I mean, could you imagine all those movies with LL Cool J instead of Wesley Snipes? Neither could we. So now with a talented team of filmmakers working with New Line Cinema to produce Blade, it was time for the supporting cast to be established. 
The role of Whistler, which many think adds a genuine sense of heart and soul to this movie, was originally planned for John Voight, and director Stephen Norrington even considered Patrick McGowan as he was a fan of The Prisoner. There also seems to be a Mandela effect where some people imagine Jeff Bridges as Whistler as a kid and didn't realize that it was actually Chris Christopherson for the longest time, but the performance was exceptional and it should not be forgotten how well the dynamic worked between Blade and Whistler. In fact, it's similar to Batman and Alfred and their relationship and it works really well in this movie. We also get Steven Dorff as our main villain, Deacon Frost, which has to be the most 90s villain name ever. And we get the beautiful and talented Nabush Wright as Karen, a victim turned sidekick whose chemistry and medicine skills prove her to be a very valuable asset to Blade and Whistler's operation. The movie began production in 1997 in Los Angeles, while some shooting was done in Death Valley. This movie had a budget of $45 million, which was not a lot compared to movies like Men in Black, which came out around the same time and was a similar movie and had a $150 million budget. The story follows Blade on a mission to help clear up underground vampire crime activity in the city, while also following Deacon Frost, the movie's villain, as he tries to find a way to eliminate the human race and cure vampires of their many traditional weaknesses. When Frost discovers that Blade's blood is the key to summoning the Blood God in order to kick off a vampire apocalypse, Blade, Karen, and Whistler must hurry to save the human race from these... Suckheads, was it? You tell him it's open season on all suckheads. Sometimes it's easy to forget just how well this movie is put together, especially considering that superhero and comic book movies were not being widely praised like they are today. The film was a risk that cost New Lion less than most movies of the genre, but went on to make their money back and then some with a astounding box office turnout of 133 million, which is actually the lowest grossing Blade theatrical release to date, but still a box office success, and it would go on to warrant two subsequent films. The cinematography of this movie is extremely well done, and it's rare to see comic book movies these days that have so much style and flair from the filmmaker. This movie uses things like the slow push-in, dramatic close-ups, incredible environment establishing shots, and of course, who could forget that wonderfully convincing 1990s CGI. In revisiting this film, you can't help but notice the many similarities between Blade and Batman, which probably hadn't really been considered at the time, but it really is kind of a consistent thread in the film. There are clear parallels to The World's Greatest Detective and Blade, as both are cold, stoic characters who don't seem to feel much outside of their motivation to avenge their loved ones. But Blade cares, and I mean genuinely cares, about Whistler. Whistler plays the role of the father figure to Blade and keeps him on the human side of his constant battle between man and beast. He's tough, gruff, and the only humanity left in him is dedicated to the memory of his lost wife and daughters who were tragically murdered by a vampire. See, Blade and Whistler share a trauma. Or at least, they think they do. Blade's motivation for his heroics and dangerous vampire hunting shenanigans can be traced back to his mother, who was attacked by a vampire and died while giving birth to her half-vampire son. Well, this movie plays on our hero's motivation when it's discovered that Blade's mother is very much alive and hasn't aged a day. It's revealed that Blade's mother was turned into a vampire by Deacon Frost on the night of the attack. In fact, Deacon Frost committed the attack. This connects Blade to our villain in a much deeper and more complicated way. This film offers us stakes, and that's something that's hard to do in movies these days because the world can only almost end so many times. But we get to follow a character who's broken, but hopeful. Blade never comes across as welcoming or friendly, to be sure, but he also doesn't hide behind a tough guy persona. He's noticeably distraught when Frost almost kills an innocent little girl, and he doesn't hide his sadness when he witnesses Whistler's final moments. This movie almost never gets mentioned in the list of best 90s movie villains, but I think that there is something to be said for the way David Goyer wrote the character of Deacon Frost. Frost comes off as your typical 1990s edgelord bad guy, but within the context of this film, he is the perfect bad guy. Steven Dorff looks like he could be the frontman of any one of your dad's favorite bands, and fans would not have it any other way. The character may seem like a typical villain in today's cape crazy world, but Deacon Frost is multidimensional in this movie in a way that goes largely unnoticed. He's sort of the rascal of his vampire litter in that he's not a natural born vampire. To him, this causes a constant feeling of insecurity, which causes Frost to both resent and eventually destroy his fellow vampire race. 
The character also sees humans as beneath him, and he often refers to them as cattle, which really shows us just how far removed he is from his previous life as a human, but he doesn't feel accepted by natural-born vampires, so he's really the perfect outcast. And in some cases, fans have said he's not a villain at all, but the hero of his own story. Seeing that the movie predates The Matrix, it is shocking how good the fight choreography and gunplay are. I really enjoyed the action considering the limited technology for CGI, but it did cause this movie to have to do a lot of things for real and with practical effects, which you just don't see enough anymore. And speaking of CGI, the special effects in this movie are dated, to say the least, but there really is a lot to appreciate in the makeup department as far as the look of the vampires, and in particular, the makeup and special effects work done on the character of Pearl. Now this image haunted the dreams of our childhood, but rewatching it again, it's only now that we can appreciate just how special this character feels within the context of this movie. Pearl is the record keeper for the criminal underground of vampire activity, and he is also the most physically dramatic character in this movie. Pearl is only in one scene, but this character makes a difference in the way that we view the vampire underground in this movie. Pearl is heavy, dirty, ugly, immobile, and clearly isolated. He doesn't look like other vampires, he doesn't really act like other vampires, and he's just a big blob of monster guts, and fans went nuts for it. Let's petition for a Pearl Solo movie. Comment in the comments if you're down. The ending of this movie definitely delivers a satisfying conclusion to the story and pretty much bookends the whole thing so that it's implied that Blade continues hunting vampires and even travels as far as Russia to take down some ugly, night-walking bloodsuckers that were lifted straight out of our nightmares. It is very nice to see a Marvel movie that is set in its own continuity and doesn't have a post credit scene that connects it to a larger universe, while still having the open option for another film. Blade 2. Of course, when we get Mahershala Ali as Blade in the MCU, I'm sure we will see him introduced in a cameo or post credit scene, but that doesn't seem to stop Blade fans from getting truly excited and curious about what he will bring to this brutal vampire hunter as it is revealed with your voice off screen that you are going to be Blade in the MCU. Overall, this movie really holds up in all the right ways. The actors give us genuinely good performances. The writing was complex and dark, the characters were multi-dimensional, and the use of practical effects really saved this movie's ability to be rewatched and taken seriously in today's world of CGI. I mean, nowadays CGI is so good you can do an entire movie in CGI and they just call it live action anyway. The film's soundtrack also made its way into the mainstream of pop culture at the time by cracking the top 50 of the Billboard 200 featuring hip hop and R&B tracks that blend through the late 90s into the early 2000s. Originally, the British techno group The Prodigy was asked to do the original motion picture soundtrack, but the band had a contractual obligation and had to work on a different project during that time. However, the music that we did end up getting is wonderful, and fans of the movie are still fans of the soundtrack today. Blade was a huge hit. People loved it. But sadly, Stephen Norrington denied the chance to return as director for the sequel, even despite the film's success at the box office. Instead, Norrington found himself teamed up with Sean Connery on the set of a big screen adaptation of Alan Moore's graphic novel, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. You're an idiot, you know that. Where he discovered that not all screen legends are gentlemen or easy to work with. After the release of The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, critics were not impressed and the film was widely panned. It was ultimately not received well by critics or fans, and Norrington even stated that he had so many issues working with Connery on the movie that he would never direct another movie again. Now walk away, you stupid son of a bitch. He later changed his mind and said he would be open to making a return to cinema, but here we are in 22 and there's no sign of a comeback on the horizon for the once promising and well-received filmmaker. Unfortunately for many movie fans, we may not see another movie directed by Stephen Norrington, but we will always have films like Blade to remind us of all the wonderful films that could have been. And as all clouds have a silver lining, all box office hits have sequels. There's a world beyond.
Beyond, the one we know. Luckily, people liked the movie at the time it came out because it spawned an order from New Line to immediately get into production and start producing a sequel that would be bigger, larger, more expensive, bloodier, and, oh yeah, directed by Guillermo del Toro. But that, of course, is a story for another episode. Thank you for watching this episode of Marvel Movies Revisited. There's plenty of movies in the zeitgeist for us to revisit, so make sure you subscribe and enable notifications so we can see you next time.